Shalom, and welcome to Via Havta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. We need to be people that think rightly. And the only way that we can think properly is when we utilize the revelation of God in our life. When we think properly, we are going to see that God will put into our hearts the right desires. So we think in light of Scripture. And God will change us so that what He desires becomes our desires. And when we think and desire properly, it is going to manifest itself in proper behavior. We are going to be committed individuals to the purposes of God. And when we are serving God, doing those things that are right in His eyes, it is going to impact our ability to worship God. So let me ask you a question. Are you operating with a godly discernment? Are you thinking properly? When you have decisions to make, are you confident that you make those decisions under the proper leadership of the Holy Spirit and not according to how you see things or what you want or what you think is right. When we do what is right in our own eyes, the Bible makes it clear that is evil in the eyes of God. It is only, only when we respond to his revelation, what he teaches us, what his word provides us in the sense of knowledge, then and only then are we going to be individuals that do that which is pleasing to God. Well, take out your Bible. We're now ready for chapter 2 of this prophecy of Micah. And we're going to see that it opens up with a word. Most English Bibles translate it woe or alas. And it foreshadows something that, that's not good. Something that, that is going to be painful, destructive, and disastrous but but some have mentioned and i frequently repeat this that this is a word of how awful something's going to be if there's no change now we learned at the end of chapter one that the people are going into exile that is what god has revealed but now in chapter two he is telling the people why and how awful it's going to be and whether there's an opportunity to, to repent and change this. Well, my personal opinion is not in this situation. Look, if you would, to chapter 2 and verse 1. It reads, woe, the Hebrew term hoy. How awful this is going to be. There's not going to be a change because notice how the people think. We read, woe, thinkers of wickedness. Now, the word wickedness, aven, is a word that speaks to the outcome of fleshly or carnal desires. Those that are not restrained, those that are rooted in our sinful nature. So sinful nature is going to cause us to think wickedly, not to have, as we learn in the New Covenant, not to have the mind of Messiah. So he says, woe, thinkers of wickedness. And then the next word has to do with activity. Those who they think wickedly, and now, and the implication is that they're planning out 
their actions. And they're doing it as it says. Those who act evilly upon their beds. And the implication is this. That they are in their beds. They have wrong way of thinking. And they are planning out now their deeds while they're in bed for the next day. So they have a wrong way of thinking, and that wrong way of thinking leads to them going over and over in their mind how they can act, behave, what they can do to fulfill their desires for wickedness. What this scripture is teaching us is that we are either going to think wickedly or think according to the righteousness of God. And how we think is going to, to in, in, increase how we behave. Whether we are growing in righteousness or whether we're increasing in wickedness. No position in between. We're going to be moving to one of these poles. Either wickedness or righteousness. So ask yourself, when you go to sleep at night, what's upon your mind? You know, there's a tradition in Judaism. It's based upon the scripture that when we lie down at night, also when we rise up in the morning, we pledge our faith. We state the Shema, attesting, testifying that there's only one God. Now, when we do that, upon our beds at night it is also accompanied by a prayer of forgiveness not just that we want to be forgiven but if anyone has done anything adverse to us we pray that they too that god would freely forgive them and not account that wrong deed that they have done to us perhaps something they've said, something that they've done, some act or behavior, that God would simply, on our request, forgive them, that there would be no judgment, no consequences from heaven upon them because how they have wronged us. Now, that is all rooted in loving your neighbor as yourself. When we have God upon our minds, when we are thinking according to his instructions, when we are interested in not wickedness, but those things that relate to righteousness, and as I've said many times, it's the commandments of God. They're not an instrument of righteousness. They can't make me righteous, but they define what is right and what is wrong. But these individuals... These ones that God is very dis disapproval of. He says, woe workers of wickedness or thinkers of wickedness. Now workers of evil that have these plans upon their beds. And what happens? In the light of the morning, they do it. And what it teaches us is as we think in our minds, so will we carry out. And that's why it's so important to be thinkers that think according to the truth of God, the standards of God, the righteousness of God, and not thinking about wickedness and that which is evil. So he says, in the morning, and this word morning, relates to shining light, revealing something. You know, it's no, no surprise that when we think about the resurrection of Messiah, we see that the women came early in the morning, but, but when it was proclaimed, there was light. It was in the morning because it was God's revealing to humanity the resurrection of of his son but here we have a revealing of these people's true intent they think wickedly they plan out evil upon their beds and notice what it says 
in the light of the morning, they do it. And then notice how this first verse ends. It says, because. Now, the question that is intrinsically being asked here is, why do they do that? And the answer is, because they have the power in their hand. Now, some have translated this simply that they have the means, they have the resources, they have, in other words, the ability to carry out this wicked thought, this evil plan that they have conjured up in the night. But it's very interesting, if you do a good study of this word for, for power, it's, it's literally the Hebrew word El. Now, we know that there is the place in, in Judah called Bethel, the house of God. El is simply the, the most common expression of God, that root that, for example, Elohim is derived from and such. And so what it's saying literally is they do this because they have El in their hand they have god and it's a reference to what we've spoke about extensively in chapter one that they have god in their hand that's what idolatry is idolatry remember statues and idols and such and it's all about having god in the palm of your hand in order that you control him and therefore as we control God, that's idolatry. We want to be in charge. We want to make the rules. We want to give the orders. And it's when we behave and think in that manner that we're going to carry out our wicked thoughts. Idolatry leads to wickedness. Idolatry leads to works of evil. That's what it's saying here. When we are desiring to serve ourselves in reality we're serving the enemy we are practicing a form of idolatry and the enemy will give us the means the resources and the opportunity to carry them out why because he loves to accuse us of our sinfulness he rejoices in the suffering the adversity, the sorrow that comes from the practice of sinfulness. So he gives us the opportunity to carry these things out. Verse, verse 2. Someone who thinks wrong, they have planning of, of sinfulness in their life. They have the means. And this is what it says here in verse 2. It's a word for coveting. And it says, they covet the fields. And the implication is, this is the inheritance. This is the possession of other people. Someone else, they have it. And now, I want it. I covet what someone else has. And because I have the power and the means and the opportunity, what does it say that these people do? It says that they steal it or take it. But this is a word which implies to steal by force. To steal through a, a threatening uh, word or action. So they steal. And not only this, it says they steal fields they, they lift up homes, meaning they take possession of homes, and they oppress a man, and not just a man, but also his household. Now, this is not so much speaking about just the possessions, but also others in the house. They love to multiply their, their evil deeds. They like to see other people suffering this oppression, this, this loss of, of their possessions in order, that, in order that they achieve their own ambition. We need to ask ourselves, do we have a godly ambition 
that is being ambitious for the things of God, His will? Or are we ambitious for our own sinful desires? When we are ambitious for the will of God, we're going to be a blessing. We're going to have an edifying effect in someone else's life. When we are ambitious for our desires, we are going to be injuring, as it says, that we are going to be oppressing a man and his household and also a man and his inheritance. Now, some have understood this last part, and by the way, we see, and we'll make mention to this later on as well, but as I said in our first study of chapter 1, prophecy is oftentimes poetic, and we see parallelism. In this verse that we're studying, verse 2, we see the word gever, which is, is man, and then we see another synonym for man, ish. So he oppresses a man and his household. Well, what's parallel to household? Obviously, gever and ish are parallel, and beto and nachalato, his inheritance. And here's the message. Not only does our actions, unrighteous actions, harm not just a man and his family in this time, but usually this idea of nachalato and inheritance speaks about the next generation, a, a future consideration. And what the Word of God is revealing to us is that our wicked actions when we think according to that which is evil, meaning against, contrary to the will and the purposes of God, we may not just be harming an individual, but if we harm this man, it is going to have an adverse outcome on his family. And not just his family, but those in the next generation into the future. Likewise, we know that when we bless, that blessing can have long-term consequences. They can have even eternal consequences. So what are we going to be doing? Being an eternal blessing, or are we going to be harming someone and that next generation that belongs to him? Verse 3, Therefore, thus said the Lord. Now I realize that, that many Bibles have thus say the Lord. But as I point out many times when studying prophecy, it's thus said the Lord. And we know that God, God is not uh, bound by anything. He is the transcendent God. We know that that name of God, yud heh vav -Heh, oftentimes enunciated Jehovah God, we know that this is the God of, of the past, present, and future. The God who was and is and will be. So he transcends time, but nevertheless, because he transcends time, he can see and know what will be. So when he speaks about something that has present implications or future implications, and he chooses to do so in the past tense. What he's saying is, this is assured that, that it's going to take place. It is a for sure thing. Read again, verse 3. Therefore, thus said the Lord, behold, I am thinking. Now, here's what's interesting. When we look at verse 1 of this chapter, chapter 2, he says, woe to those thinkers who are thinking wickedly. And we know a principle. The measure that we use will be measured back unto us. When we think wickedly, and here the implication is the context against others. We put ourselves, we exalt ourselves at, at someone else's expense. 
We want their fields. We want their home. We want their inheritance. We care nothing about what that's going to do to that family in this age or the age to come. It's all about me. When we think incorrectly, it is going to make God, now God's sovereign, but again, we need to see that there are spiritual laws. And when we behave one way, it brings about God's behavior in a certain response. It's not that we are making God, but God has set forth laws. And he says, if you do this, then I'll bless. If you do that, then I'll curse. It has nothing to do with an attack of his sovereignty, but simply the, the realization of his spiritual laws. So when I think improperly towards someone else, God is going to think adversely to me. And let's see exactly what he says here. Look again at verse 3. Therefore, thus said the Lord, behold, I am thanking concerning this family. Who's this family? We're talking about his people, the family of God, the covenantal people of the Lord. We're talking about Israel in the broadest sense. And he says, I'm thinking about this family. And what word does he use to describe his thinking? It's the word ra'ah. Now, that word ra'ah, it's feminine because family, but it could be masculine, ra, whether it's ra or ra'ah, masculine or feminine, it means that which is evil. Now, if you look at most English translations, they certainly won't have the word evil there. But the point is this, they don't know what the intent of the biblical word ra or evil in English is. It simply means that which is contrary to God's will. Here's the proper way to understand this. God does not create someone saying, I have made him in order that the adverse, the opposite of my will will be placed upon him. God does not do that. The Bible says that God desires that all would repent and find life. God is not a respecter of persons. The scripture says that. He has no favorites. And these laws are applied equally to all individuals. So God has a desire, and let's just make this specific within the context. He has a desire to use Israel to be a blessing. And in making them to be a blessing, they will be blessed. This is God's purpose for redeeming them out of Egypt and bringing them into the land and all his provision in their life, all of his revelation to them. But now because, as we saw in verse 1, as we saw in chapter 1 as well, they are rebellious. They are not interested in thinking properly because they don't want to live properly. They're not interested in discernment and knowledge and wisdom from God because they're not interested in the will of God. They are rebellious and they are thinking wrong. So instead of God doing what is good, this is his will. He now will do that which is not his will from beginning with. But because he's righteous, he's holy, he punishes sin. He punishes rebelliousness. This is not his desire to begin with. God does not have any need to create people to punish them. But when people who are created are rebellious, yes, he will punish them. And this punishment Sometimes this destruction, his wrath being poured out, magnifies his glory, his holiness. He can use all things to manifest his glorious glory, to manifest his righteousness. And this is what he's going to do with Israel. Israel is going to be a recipient of God's activity. God's will, that which is good, 
for them to be obedient and to be blessed. But if they're rebellious, God is going to manifest his faithfulness to his word by bringing judgment. So it says here the word ra'ah, it's not his desire to begin with. It was not his will. His will is quite something different. But because of their actions, he says, I am thinking concerning this family ra'ah, evil, which they will not be. Literally, you, it makes it personal. That you, meaning you all, it's in the plural, will not be able to, to remove yourself from there. And then he has your necks. Now, I would suggest to you that here there is indeed a slight hint of God's compassion and mercy because he's displeased with the people. He says that his judgment is coming, but... Even though the people cannot remove themselves, that it's going to come to them, he says, to their necks. Not all the way, but to their necks. Meaning that this judgment is not going to be an all consuming, it is not going to be a complete pouring out of his wrath. And we know this because he goes on to say, that he's going to bring a change. Look at the middle of verse 3. And you will not walk, and the word is Roma. Roma means exalted. We could think of that in regard to pride. You will not walk pridefully. You will not walk in a haughty spirit. You will not be ones that continue to exalt yourself. Because he says, now at this time, and remember, chapter 1 ended with a hint of exile. He says, you will not walk in an exalted way, for the time is evil. Meaning this, Israel's not going to experience God's will. What he created Israel to experience what he wants to do, how they should be used at this moment. Instead of that, they are going to experience the opposite of God's will. Be, instead of being in the land, once more, they're going to exile. But I mentioned that there is a hint, and we'll come to it in a moment, of, of God's grace, his mercy. Because soon we're going to encounter a most significant word prophetically. And this is the word remnant. But before we get there, let's move on, if we could, to verse, verse 4. Be'yom ha'hu, in that day. Now, if you're following along in our other prophetic studies, you will be most familiar with that term, be'yom ha'hu, in that day. And that day is a reference to judgment day. So this people at this time, and remember, this is all foreshadowing. We know that, that Micah prophesied approximately 2,800 years ago. Most scholars believe before the northern kingdom went into exile. And that would mean that approximately 200 years, 200 years before the Babylonian captivity or 130 years after the northern tribes went into exile. Judah had much time to repent. God was very long-suffering. He was indeed, and this is going to be important in a moment, patient with them but but his patience ran out because he saw no desire from the people to to embrace his will so in that day this parable will be lifted up unto you now let's just talk for a moment about what a parable is a parable is usually a a short statement it is a, a teaching full of wisdom 
But what we need to realize is the word for parable has to do with, with government. It is knowledge for the purpose of ruling your life, meaning this. A parable teaches me a spiritual truth, a spiritual principle. And that truth, that knowledge, that wisdom, that principle should govern my life. It should rule my life. And it's only when I submit to that knowledge, that wisdom, that parable or uh, proverb, then and only then am I going to manifest these qualities that are pleasing to God. So they'll take up this this parable, this proverb, same word. One is Greek-based. The other one is is Hebrew-based. But he says, they're going to find knowledge, knowledge of God by how I treat you. They're going to say, God doesn't tolerate sin. He doesn't tolerate rebelliousness. But look at the entire verse, verse 4. In that day, a proverb or parable will be lifted up unto you and what's going to be when that's done when god manifests his knowledge his wisdom through discipline you sending you into exile there's going to be a time of lamentation now the word here for lamentation appears three times so the people are going to speak, it says, and, and he spoke lamenting, utterly lamenting. So it's a, a great time of, of sorrow. And why is that? Well, people are going to see that the destruction, it says, Shadod Nisha Dunu. Now, the word Shoded is a word for a thief. This has to do with, with losing everything, becoming destitute. But most Bibles translate it as relating to destruction. Well, the, the message is this. When you lose everything, you have been destroyed. And that's what God's going to do. He is going to utterly destroy that southern kingdom. He is going to take the people into exile. And Judah and the holy city of Jerusalem and the temple are going to be laid to ruins. Everything of value is going to be carried away. So the people, he will lament a great lamentation. For, for we have been utterly plundered or destroyed. And the portion of my people, it will be exchanged. Now, this word has to do with a transfer. In modern Hebrew, we use this word for, for exchanging currency. You may have a currency. You may have the, the currency of one country, and you want to change it, convert it into the currency another. Now, this has, in biblical Hebrew, the ideal of a transfer, a change, where there was value that belonged to one, but now it changed. There was a new possessor of that. And what God is saying is, that which I have given to you, it's going to be changed. It is going to find itself in the hands of, of someone else. And that's why when we keep reading, it says, how will, will this be, be, be taken from me? How will, will this escape me? And he says, to thee, and the word here, in modern Hebrew, we have the term yelled shovav, a mischievous child. And this is a word for it, derived from the same root, but it has to do with an enemy one that is a an oppressor one who puts mischievous things upon another and this one this exchange he's going to become the possessor of what god god has given to his people so to this this mischievous one 
our, our fields will be divided. He will divide it. Verse, verse 5. Therefore, there will not be to you a caster of a rope in the future in the congregation of Israel. Now, the word I translated future is the word goral. And it, it, it can mean the lot. What lot, what portion did I receive? Well, there is a tradition, a way of life, a culture. And this is why knowing the culture is so important. And even though there is not, in my opinion, any revelation in the Gemara, in the oral law, oral law, but there's things that can greatly enhance our ability to understand the scripture. Because much of what we see in the scripture is coming to us within a context, within a society that is foreign to the vast majority of people. And when it talks about the one who cast the rope, it's speaking about a time when someone would receive an inheritance and, and how they received it. And we're talking about a plot of land. They would go to the border with a rope and they would throw that rope. And where it would arrive to would mark another boundary. Where it began, begins your inheritance. Where it ends, completes it. It marks out the boundaries for this inheritance that someone is receiving. So when it says in the scripture, there's not going to be anyone to cast forth the rope, what it means is there's not a future. There's no one that's going to inherit anything in the near future. All that what was has been stopped. This is what this passage is saying. So look again. He says, And there will not be to you a caster of the rope in your lot within the congregation of the Lord. Verse 6. Now, most Bibles, they're going to translate this maybe with a prophet. But it's really the word that that relates to preaching or a preacher. Now, some would, would suggest to you that the prophet received the revelation of God. He wrote it down, he spoke it, and there were others who heard it. They would learn from the prophet, and therefore they would take these words and they would preach them to others to enhance this ministry and revelation that the prophet received. So notice what it says in verse 6. Do not preach, O preachers. Do not preach to these. Now, what it could mean is this, that Mika and others were proclaiming, preaching his word, giving out this revelation. And there were those who said, don't preach these things or don't preach these things to these people. They did not want it to be heard. And the reason why is, and this goes very similar to what we learn in Jeremiah, but let's complete it, it says, for not will overtake us this shame. Now, us is not in the text, but it's just clarifying the intent. It will not overtake this shame. But the context is that the people won't experience shame. But the prophet Micah says they will. So the people are saying, don't preach these things to us. For it's not going to happen. We are not going to experience shame and embarrassment. That's what, what they're saying. We don't want to hear this, this talk about our future. Verse, verse 5 or verse 7. 
will it be said to the house of Jacob that the, that the Lord, and it says here, is short-spirited, meaning he's impatient? Is that what's going to be said to, to Jacob? Is that the words that you have for us, that God has run out of patience? And the answer is yes. That's exactly what Micah is saying. Are these his deeds? What you're saying, is this how the God of Jacob behaves? And once again, the answer is yes, it is. But this is not what they have believed. What have they believed? Well, the context is this. They have believed in a God that is forever patient, forever forgiving, always loving, always gracious, always bestowing, and never changing. But this is not the biblical God. There is, he's long-suffering, but patience, his patience runs out. And because God is holy and a lover of righteousness and a hater of sin, there does come that time when indeed God says, no more patience. When God says, these are the actions that I will take upon my people. He has done it previously, and he's going to do it here, and he's going to do it into the future. These people who don't want to hear prophecy because prophecy doesn't, doesn't connect with their wrong understanding of the nature of God. Verse Verse 7, the second part. Surely, and this is what the response is from the true prophet. He says, surely my words, they will do good if you in uprightness straight walk. So he's saying God has a good word, but it's only for those who walk, live. In an upright manner these people aren't interested in that which is straight that which is upright that which is is fitting for the character of the people of God in agreement with the commandments that God has given the people they have rejected all of this and therefore God's anger God's punishment is going to come upon them verse 8 we have the word etmol etmol is yesterday now here it's it's kind of asking a question and we have the hay in front of it but here we shouldn't translate it yesterday but it's talking about something that is recent or lately so he's speaking about a current situation. And this is the current situation. And the question is, is this not what, what's happening now? Isn't this what's going on currently among the people? And what is he referring to? Well, look carefully at verse 8. And recently, my people is an enemy. Now, the implication is, has become for an enemy, became an enemy to God. And why is that? Why are his covenant people, how did they become an enemy? Well, realize, God has absolute standards. I was listening this week. It was the second time I heard this individual share this specific message. It was on TV and it was repeated. And he was teaching a large congregation. And he was saying, you know, it's not about right and wrong. What may be right for someone may be wrong for someone else. Now, we need to remember the context. The standard was making right decisions. And what he was saying is, there's not absolutes. Now, if we're talking about well, do I want uh, uh, pasta or chicken? Then what might be right for one may not be what the other one desires. But the context, the, the standard was the will of God. 
what is right in God's sight. And it is extremely dangerous when we want to make everything situational and personal. And he was saying it's not about right or wrong, what's good or evil. He said, you have to do what is wise. But here's the problem. Wisdom would lead us to do something specific, the right thing, the good thing. But he was saying, you know, even if you're not a believer, it's okay. Just follow your heart. Just do what seems wise, the right thing to you. Well, here's the problem. Our heart is above all most deceitful. And when we're not operating under revelation, it's the revelation of God that teaches us what is right and what is wrong. You cannot just say to someone, think about it, do what is right in your heart and everything's going to be okay. That's wisdom. That is not wisdom. That is the surest way to invite the enemy into your life to manipulate you to make very unwise decisions. You may think this was wise. It's not. Wisdom is always tested with the word of God to see if it's wisdom from God or a counterfeit wisdom from the enemy that is so, so what we want to hear. That's the problem. We need to be submissive to his authority. So he writes here about the people who have become an enemy. And why is that? Because they have gotten up against a garment. Now, the next word here is kind of the word for a, a specific garment, one that was a special garment. And the implication is that it's a rather uh, uh, good or splendor garment. And the person has risen up in order that they can take that garment. In fact, the next thing is that they have, have uh, stripped this one of that garment. That's exactly what it says. Look carefully. We're reading in, in verse 8. For my people have become an enemy. They have risen up against or before this garment, this garment of, of splendor. And we see here that they have stripped meaning that they have stolen it. And who have they stolen it from? Well, notice what it says, me of rim betach. Now, this is the passers-by, those who pass by. So we're speaking of someone who's traveling, and the next work speaks about someone who is trusting, someone who thinks things are, are safe or secure. Why? Because they're in the land of Israel. They expect there to be justice and righteousness. They do not expect that it's a dangerous location. So they're traveling, they're passing by with a sense of confidence, with a sense of assurance. I don't have to be concerned because I'm in Israel. And what happens? Well, these people rise up. And if we keep reading in this text, it says, Shuve milchama. And the term here, shuve, are the returners of war. Here again, we need to know the cultural connection. The, the message is this. Armies would go out to fight, and let's say they were victorious. When they were on their way home, they would go through the enemy's land, and every village or town that they would go through, they would take spoil. They would take plunder from them because those individuals lost. So they would go through and take, and what's saying here is this, the people of Israel and Judah, they are treating the passerbyers, those who are going through, and they see something that they like, a nice garment, and they just strip that off the person. And they behave as though they are the ones returning from war. That these are the enemies. Well, we're supposed to love our enemies, pray for our enemies. We're supposed to be a blessing to strangers, not a threat. So in the same way that Israel was supposed to entertain strangers like 
Avraham did, running out this old man after his circumcision in the heat of the day and inviting people in. That's that, that godly hospitality, not when someone's passing by to go out and rob them and take from them like they are the enemies. Verse, verse 9. Now we're going to see another statement concerning the family. And we see that the family was in disarray. The family was dysfunctional. Notice what we read here. Verse, verse 9. The women of my people take Garshun. Now, this word is the ancient Hebrew word and also the current Hebrew word for divorce. So, the women of my people, you are divorcing. When you look at the rabbinical com commentators, they say this. Divorce was prevalent. It was rampant in society back then. Men would get married and they would simply give a divorce decree. I want to pause for a moment because we know in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 31, we have that, that word for a divorce decree. And it's so interesting and so significant that if you study that word, it's a word for apostasy. Apostasy is a false teaching, but it literally is a departure. And the context biblically is a departure from that which is good to something that is not good. It's making a wrong falling away a, a departure that is not proper. And what we see here is that the men were devaluating women. So it says, verse, verse 9, the women of my people, you are divorcing. You are literally, the word is casting away. You cast them away from, from the house of their pleasant ones or her pleasant ones referring to a woman and parallelism is going to tell us that we're speaking about children so a man he casts his woman away he gives her that divorce decree what's called a a document of apostasy by yeshua and they are cast away from their pleasant ones meaning those their children and why do I know that these ones for, for delight, delight ones, ones that delight them, it's the children? Because it says, from a pawn, and then we have a word, for their children, literally her children, you take my glory forever. What does he mean here? God had a purpose for this children. And God's purpose was in a family, a family that consisted of a father and a mother. And now that man cast the woman aside. He divorced her. And what he's saying is that this is going to have eternal consequences. This is not going to be something that, that is insignificant. This is going to have, and notice, that family was supposed to manifest his glory. But now that's not going to be dead, done because there is a spiritual attack on this family. So he's saying, and this is relevant to us because divorce is, is extensive in our culture as well. Verse, verse 10. Rise up and go. Now, this is a normal expression for for lifestyle get up and go meaning live and we should live under the purposes the will of god but here notice what it says the poor people are rising up and going that is they're living but he says this is not be very careful he says for this is not my rest now i would highlight circle underline this word rest and the reason for this is because rest and the hebrew word is menucha 
is a kingdom word. It's also related to Shabbat, and we know, and I've spoken many times, that Shabbat and the kingdom are interrelated. When we experience Sabbath rest, it's a foretaste of that kingdom rest. So he's saying, the way you're living, your lifestyle, is not not producing rest. It's not related to a kingdom lifestyle. Another example that he's displeased with the people. And he goes on to say, for instead of experiencing a blessing of rest, it says, on account of, of tum'ah. And this is a word for, for defilement. This is a word for that which is unclean. So on account of this, what's going to be the outcome? Well, he says, on account of this, you will experience. And the word is the modern word for terrorism. And the word means that you're going to be experiencing hardship. You are going to be harmed. And if you look at it, it says, a very intense harm. Now, if you, God willing, this won't be your situation, but if Poloni, if someone goes to the hospital, they go into a hospital room for care. But if they're in a really bad situation, they will go for a place called intensive care. And the word for intensive is this word at the end of the verse, and it speaks about an intensive, a strong blow, a strong destruction that God is going to place upon the people. Verse 11. Now it's speaking about hypocrisy. He says, Lu, meaning really? A man will, will walk, and it literally is in the present, a man goes spiritually some bibles will say he will walk in the spirit but it's a profession he will go about spiritually but but what really will he do well keep reading in verse 11 for will a man walk spiritually and lie and deceive and will he say i preach to you wine and strong drink and Mika says that that such preaching is basically fitting for this people now what is that strong drink and wine it is those that want to experience folly they're not wanting a real joy they don't want a real satisfaction they want a manufactured satisfaction or joy or happiness that comes through alcohol but we know something that wears off really quick and that joy those feelings are false it manufactures within your own senses something that that you may experience that's joyful but it's not based upon reality and that's what he's saying they want a preacher that makes them feel good they're not looking for reality they're not basing their life upon truth they just want to escape into this this fantasy world that makes them feel good verse verse 12. now we're coming to the end of of this chapter and if you look in chapter one not really anything that speaks about good news not anything that's really encouraging that brings joy and likewise we've gone through 11 of 13 verses of chapter 2 and again not really anything that speaks about hope that which is joyful that which is good news but as we conclude chapter 2, he's going to do so with a message of encouragement. Now, let me just simply say that uh, these words of prophecy that we've studied in chapter 1 and chapter 2, they're not going to be 
taught to many people because they don't have what the people want to hear. They are not words that tickle ears. They will not fill large stadiums. But God, after speaking these harsh words, he's going to teach a very important principle, and that is this, that God is a keeper of covenant. For who? For a remnant. This is so important that we see this. In prophecy, we see frequently that God speaks about the remnant of Israel. And notice what we find. Now, the people, they haven't changed, but God is going to keep covenant with them. He is going to act and his faithful actions based upon grace and mercy and love and compassion. It is going to bring about a change. Look at verse, verse 12. I will gather, gather. Now, what he says is, he uses that same word, asaf, for gathering together. And he uses it twice. Perhaps your Bible, and this is a fine way to do it, I will utterly or totally gather up. God is going to do and fulfill what he said he's going to do with his people. But what people are we talking about? Well, once again, verse 12. I will utterly gather Jacob, all of you. Second part. I will assemble, assemble. Here it is. The remnant of Israel. Now, what I like here is that in the Hebrew language, we see that the construction in regard to what God's going to do, it's the same word repeated twice, both for gathering and assembly. So God's going to gather up. He's going to utterly assemble a remnant of his people. But notice that he speaks about Jacob, all of you it's all of the remnant and he's going to do it based upon who he is and it's going to be god's faithfulness that is going to bring about a true change a true repentance of the people now we're going to look and conclude this chapter right now but what you need to see before we do is the terminology here is very similar to what Yeshua taught, the basis for some of his greatest teaching. He is that great shepherd. He is the one that's going to burst through and bring about a, a gathering up. Now, we're seeing the foretaste of that, the fact that a great number of the people, children of Jacob, they have returned back to the land. I'm a testimony of that in my family. God is bringing his people back to the land. But just as Messiah taught in Matthew 24 and verse 31, where he sends forth his angels to gather up that last group and bring them back to the land, this is what he's talking about here. This assembling the people back to the land. Once more, I will utterly gather up Jacob, all of you. I will utterly assemble the remnant of Israel together and I will place them as sheep could be I will make them as sheep in and the word here Botsra don't believe it's speaking about a location but it's speaking about a word that relates to a sheep pen he says I'm going to gather you up into the sheep Pen. And who's he going to gather into? A flock, the Hebrew word sown, a large flock of sheep that he's going to gather in. Very similar to what we see in John chapter 10, where he tells us that he is the good shepherd. And the good shepherd goes, and we have parables that speak about him gathering the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then remember Hebrew poetry, parallelism, as a a herd, a herd in the midst of, and he has another word 
a parallel word, a synonym for a sheep pen. So God is going to gather up through who? Well, we all know the answer, through Messiah. As we conclude this second chapter, we see a hint of a messianic prophecy that speaks about gathering the people up, a shepherd doing so, gathering up his flock, gathering up his herd, and putting them into the sheep pen, the right location where they will be safe. And notice how verse 12 ends. And, and a humming, and this is a word for a noise from man, meaning there's going to be much humming, much noise coming from men. Now, why does it say that? Because this sheep are not literal sheep, but human beings. And there's going to be much noise. This could be much statement, much talk. The world is going to be a buzz because of what God is doing in bringing the people back to the land. Could be in a positive sense or a negative sense. Last verse, verse 13. Here we have the word, ha poretz, the one who bursts forward, the one who, who goes forward, bursting through a barrier. And we see this one is a reference to Mashiach. So Messiah, we read here that he is going to go up and burst forth before them. And they, like him, they're going to follow. They're going to burst forth and pass through the gate. They're going to go out in it, meaning this. They're going to go out from exile in him or with him. It's the Hebrew term vo, which can mean with him or by him. He's going to be the one that gathers them up, perhaps through his angels, as Matthew 24, verse 31 says. They are going to go out with him, and he will pass. Who will pass? Their king. Now, this is another reference to Messiah. And their king will pass before them. And then we have a great great verse because this is parallelism in the same that way that we saw that to gather up is parallel to assemble up in the same way that we see that sheep a flock of sheep is parallel to the word herd in the same way that that a sheep pen and a sheep uh, uh, house are parallel to one another all of this is to lead us to the conclusion that this messianic prophecy Speaking about the Redeemer, who is this? Notice it speaks about, and the Lord is at their head, meaning he's leading them. And the important thing here is that this verse speaks the parallel demands that, that it's, we understand the divinity of Messiah. It is of the utmost significance that this messianic prophecy that no one disputes it speaks of Messiah. We know Messiah Yeshua. But the laws of Hebrew poetry parallels Messiah to the Lord. And that fact speaks of his divinity. The more you examine the word of God, the more you'll encounter passages that speak loudly about the divinity of Messiah. Well, I'll close with that until we continue on next session in chapter 3. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week. May the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. <laughs>